Amen. Let us pray. God of grace, we give thanks for your presence among us. As we sing our song of praises, we know that we are doing more than just singing to the ceiling. And we are filled by the presence of your love with us. May I speak, may there be more of, as I speak, may there be more of, of you and less of me in the things that I say. And may that spirit of love infill us, empower us to be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, I wonder if you ever had the chance to write a Netflix script, what your final words for your lead character would be as they were about to sail off into the sunset or ride off on horseback or dragon back, depending on the sort of show, or if they were about to hop into their Tesla or their helicopter or their spaceship, or maybe even just walking off through the mountains. What would be their final words? Because both of the passages that we've read this morning are a little bit like that. They're the scripted words of some of the lead characters that we read in Scripture. In Joshua 24, it's the last chapter of Joshua, we have Joshua speaking to the people of Israel, giving them their final, his final address to them. And in Matthew's Gospel, we have the fifth of five special discourses, special speeches that Jesus makes in Matthew's Gospel. It's the last one that he gives, and it's all about what we call the end times. I wonder what you would say if you've ever thought. Maybe, maybe you've made dramatic exits at different times in your life and you've looked back and you think, I wish I'd said something different. It's interesting to see what these two significant people in the history of the Christian faith chose as their final words. We're going to have a look at them very briefly. In Joshua 24, it's the last chapter in the story of Joshua, but it's more than that. It's the last chapter, if you like, in the story that has led the people of God from slavery to the promised land. For those who know the story, the people of Israel have been enslaved by Pharaoh. If you've seen, the, you've seen the movies, the Ten Commandments or the Prince of Egypt, it tells the story of the slaves being set free. That's only part of the story. Because as the story continues, Moses, who leads them through the desert, is not allowed to enter into the promised land. That is Joshua's part in the story. So Joshua leads them into the promised land and along the way they get the Ten Commandments. The big promises of God seem to have been fulfilled. You have the law, not just the Ten Commandments, there's a whole heap of them, about 630 different rules that God gives the people of God. You have the law, you have now the promised land. Now what? Joshua encourages the people of Israel and we only need to have a look at what's happening in that part of the world right now to think if only the people of Israel had listened well, maybe that wouldn't be such a trouble spot as it is right now. We have the law and the promised land. And Joshua leaves them with this kind of challenge. He says, choose this day whom you will serve. It's like all the pieces of the puzzle are there for you. You have everything you need. The rest, it seems, is up to you, the people of Israel. Choose this day. The day of reckoning has arrived. It's a great final speech. If we look at it closely, though, we discover that there's a bit more happening here. Having faith means more than simply believing in God. This morning in our baptism service, in every baptism service, we stand as a congregation and we say what it is that we believe. Those statements of faith didn't come until a couple of centuries after Jesus. Back in Joshua's day, they didn't have those statements of faith. They had the Ten Commandments, they had the law, but the people of Israel weren't asked whether they believed in the law. They weren't even asked whether they believed in God. They were asked whether they would serve, whether they would be faithful. It seems that having faith means more than simply 
believing. And in fact, when we read the text closely, we'll discover that Joshua almost tries to talk them out of believing. He says the people of God should revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then he goes on to say to the people of Israel, don't don't serve God because God will be a jealous God. He will demand, God will demand much of you. If you can do anything else, do that. And we're left with this challenge that it's almost as though every now and then it's a good idea to try to talk yourself out of faith. Because then you'll discover why your faith remains. Why are you here? What's this Jesus thing all about? Isn't there something else you could be doing on a Sunday morning? Why make this kind of commitment? Is it about what we believe? Because faith requires more than belief. Faith requires a commitment to serve. To be a part of what God is doing. It requires creativity and courage, imagination and faithfulness. It requires the entirety of your life. It's a big call. Joshua takes time to try and convince the people of Israel to do something else. But they stick with God. I wonder if we were given the same opportunity here today, what would our response be? So let's keep that in mind as we travel forward a number of centuries and we come to the story of Jesus. And we find this in Matthew chapter 25. Now I said this is like the fifth speech section in the Matthew's Gospel. We had the Sermon on the Mount where we get the Beatitudes from. That was his, the first big discourse passage. Then we have another big discourse passage on mission where Jesus sends out the disciples in pairs to tell everyone the good news of God's love. Then we have another big speech section where Jesus lists a number of parables of the kingdom of God. He's trying to explain to the people what the kingdom of God looks like. Then we have another bit, the fourth big discourse is about the nature of the church. There was no church back then. It was a scattered community, but Jesus in Matthew's gospel is explaining what the church will be like. And then the fifth big discourse, right before the cross, Jesus chooses to make this section about what scholars and theologians call the eschaton, the end times. Now, we tend to think of the end times as something that's chronological, like the end of the world, where everything comes, you know, the, when, the, when the clock stops ticking, where the world comes to its completion, it's the finality. But of course, that word is also about fulfillment. It's not just about what happens when the clock runs out. It's about what life is all about. It's about the meaning of life. And he chooses to talk about this in a parable. And the one we have today is about a wedding. More specifically, it's about some bridesmaids. Ten bridesmaids. Now, a little bit of context here. In Jesus' day, a wedding wasn't just a service that happened in a, in a place like this. A wedding was a celebration that would last for about a week. And it was about two families coming together. Two families coming together and the community would gather around and celebrate together. It was a wondrous occasion. And what would happen is the bride would leave her family and join the groom in creating a new family. And part of the ceremony was entering into the new house. And the, and the bridesmaids would line up along the path from the old house to the new house. And they'd do it at night and they'd hold torches. And the whole community would gather around. And it was a great honour to be part of that ceremony. The parable Jesus tells then is, is quite sobering to talk about ten bridesmaids who had one job that when the groom turns up to light the path, but five of them, their oil runs out. That's the context of this parable. Now, some people look at this story as an allegory. So you try and get each element of the story matches up with something as part of a lesson. And this is, tends to be how that is understood. That the bridesmaids are the church. The ten bridesmaids represent the, the church. The bridegroom is Jesus. 
The, the wedding feast that happens is we paralleled in Revelation with the, the wedding feast at the end of time. And Jesus tells other parables about great wedding feasts as well. The, de the delay of the groom corresponds to Matthew's community. But this gospel is written probably about 50 to 60 years after Jesus was crucified. They're wondering when is Jesus coming back. So the idea of this story saying you need to wait, the groom has been delayed. It's quite contextual, even more so for us 2,000 years on. Be patient. It's okay. Jesus is coming back. There's been a delay. The bridegroom's arrival is the second coming. And the fact that the door is closed, remembering there are ten bridesmaids, five had oil in their lamps, they get in. The other five who don't, they're shut out. That that is, represents the final judgment. This can be very helpful, but... But when we look at parables as purely allegorical, we miss some of the meaning. We need to be careful how we extend this kind of thinking. There's a very famous apocryphal sermon that happened in a seminary in the United States uh, where the president of Garrett Theological Seminary, Dr. Iceland, was talking to the, the young men who were preparing to be ministers. Back in those days, it was only men. And they were all gathered around and he was giving, preaching in chapel and he, he, as his sermon reached its, its conclusion, its climax, his, his voice started to raise, he was getting excited. He said, tell me, young men, would you rather be in the light with the five wise virgins or would you rather be in the dark with the five foolish virgins? And what started as a snicker became a raucous laughter and apparently chapel had to finish early that day. Parables are not meant as allegories. They're meant to provoke us into thinking through the alternatives. Because the real, when you look at this allegorical comparison, a lot of that stuff might make sense. There's a question. What's the deal with the oil? This parable, at the end of the parable, Jesus says, stay awake. But the message of the parable can't just simply be about staying awake because all ten virgins, all ten bridesmaids fell asleep. The difference between the two sets of bridesmaids is not about who fell asleep and who stayed awake. It's the fact that some had oil in their lamp and others did not. Now, I don't know about you, but I can remember as a young person thinking, well, why didn't the bridesmaids who had the oil share some of their oil with the other bridesmaids, right? Christians are most supposed to be generous and are supposed to share what they have with those who don't. That's a pretty basic human you know, in, endeavour to to care for those and share with those who go without. But perhaps there are some things that we are unable to share. Faith might be one of them. You can't share your faith with another person in the sense that they take on the faith that you have. That person's faith is their own. Character might be another. You can't share your character with another person such that they take on your character. Commitment may be another. You can't share your commitment such that the other person takes on your commitment. They have to make their own. This parable is about the commitment, the character, the faith, the service that we all bring to the gospel. Staying awake means more than not falling asleep. All ten bridesmaids fall asleep. No matter how generous we are, there are some things that we cannot share with others. Waiting on God means that we need to become waiters. Waiting for Christ's return is not about us sitting around twiddling our thumbs, watching the clock tick down. We are called to be waiters. Waiting on God means we are called to serve the kingdom of God, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to bring healing and hope to the lost and the broken. This is what we are meant to be doing while we wait for the kingdom to come. Because in doing these things, we build the kingdom. In doing these things, we usher in the kingdom. In fact, this is what we are called to do. Now, this is not just about finding something to do and feel good about ourselves for doing it. It's about taking the time 
to understand our context. Loving your neighbour takes time. It takes intentionality. It begins by learning their name, discovering their needs, their concerns, their passions, their hopes. And when we share our faith with another, it's not that they take upon our faith, it's that they're given the seeds and the opportunity and the hope to develop their own relationship with God. This is what it means to take seriously the word of Joshua, that we might serve with faithfulness the God who has welcomed us into the promised land. This is what it means to be the bridesmaids who have oil in their lamp, ready for Christ's return, because our faith is a faith that is living. In many ways, discipleship, the journey of faith, is a bit like going on a hike. Your desire for the adventure of faith that lies ahead needs to convince your feet that it's worth the effort. If you ever got up in the morning thinking we're going to go for a hike and that's as far as your intentionality got, you'll know what I'm talking about. You need to do more than just put on your boots and fill up your water bottle. You need to put one foot in front of the other. And halfway along, it might, you might feel like turning back. Discipleship can be a lot like that. But the good news is this. We do not do this great adventure alone. This morning we welcomed Sadie into the journey. And we made a commitment to support her along the way. And I'm hoping as you made those commitments you were looking sideways, seeing who's making those commitments with you. Because we are in this journey together. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for your love that calls us forward. Help us to make sure that there is oil in our lamps so that the light of your love may shine. Help us to encourage faith in each other. Not that we can share our oil and fill up someone else's lamp, but that we can encourage them and show them and help them to fill up their own lamp. That each person's commitment, each person's service, each person's faithfulness would be a witness and a testimony to your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.